It's great to have everyone here today. I'm going to be doing the manual for teachers, section 15. So I will get ready to share my screen here. All right, let's make this bigger. All right, A Course in Miracles manuals for teachers, section 15. Is each one to be judged in the end? Indeed, yes. No one can escape God's final judgment. Who could flee forever from the truth? But the final judgment will not come until it is no longer associated with fear. One day, each one will welcome it. And on that very day, it will be given him. He will hear his sinlessness proclaimed around and around the world, setting it free as God's final judgment on him is received. This is the judgment in which salvation lies. This is the judgment that will set him free. This is the judgment in which all things are freed with him. Time pauses as eternity comes near and silence lies across the world that everyone may hear this judgment of the Son of God. Holy are you, eternal, free, and whole, at peace forever in the heart of God. Where is the world? And where is sorrow now? Is this your judgment on yourself, teacher of God? Do you believe that this is wholly true? No, not yet, not yet. But this is still your goal, why you are here. It is your function to prepare yourself to hear this judgment and to recognize that it is true. One instant of complete belief in this and you will go beyond belief to certainty. One instant out of time can bring time's end. Judge not, for you but judge yourself, and thus delay this final judgment. What is your judgment of the world, teacher of God? Have you yet learned to stand aside and hear the voice of judgment in yourself? Or do you still attempt to take his role from him? Learn to be quiet for his voice is heard in stillness. And his judgment comes to all who stand aside in quiet listening and wait for him. You who are sometimes sad and sometimes angry, who sometimes feel your just due is not given you and your best efforts meet with lack of appreciation and even contempt, give up these foolish thoughts. They are too small and meaningless to occupy your holy mind an instant longer. God's judgment waits for you to set you free. What can the world hold out to you, regardless of your judgments on its gifts, that you would rather have? You will be judged and judged in fairness and in honesty. There is no deceit in God. His promises are sure. Only remember that. His promises have guaranteed his judgment and his alone will be accepted in the end. It is your function to make that end be soon. It is your function to hold it in your heart and offer it to all the world to keep it safe. Look right to Cynthia. <laughs> Quiet listening. Cynthia, she's getting it this morning, or this <laughs> afternoon, I should say. I thought that was quite timely. <laughs> yeah. really, I'm getting it today from everyone. <laughs> <laughs> You're not alone. <laughs> I appreciate it. It makes me feel part of the group, even though I don't speak. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you get um when you get um like made fun of, you're like, all right, I'm part of the group. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Everyone uh, gets a turn. That's right. That's right. <laughs> this was really good. Um, the one part that really stood out for me and kind of jumped at me um, 
was the first paragraph, the first sentence in paragraph three, you who are sometimes sad and sometimes angry, who sometimes feel your just due is not given you and your best efforts meet with lack of appreciation and even contempt. There it is, right? Give up these foolish thoughts. <laughs> that was yep. me last week. Yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. And the lessons really helped with that. But boy, it's just right there. You know, simple. Not always easy, but simple. How quickly we go into these funky, uh, you know, rooms or whatever. I don't even know what to call it, but just you, you get into this funk, you know, like, and it just kind of presses down on you. And you got you to gotta act on it, though. I, for me, I, you got to act and do something different. Like, but I told you Friday was for me, like, you know. Right, right. Yeah, yeah change and, your energy and motion, right? Change your, to change your yeah. emotion. And I wasn't even looking to get out of funk. I just wanted to just, you know, do something different. I didn't have, I didn't go with any expectations. I put it to you that way. Yeah. And it worked That's out. I mean, and, and, and when I was in it, I, was, I wasn't even aware of it until it, I was all done and I was on my way home. And I was like, wow. What just happened, you know? And I started thinking, you know, you start rolling it in your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, the lesson reviews this week have been great, all about letting go of grievances and just allowing yourself to be the light. And, and really I, holding I, space. For, go ahead, Freddie. I decided not to do the lessons this, this, this year. Yeah. I look at them occasionally. Yeah. But actually, I don't think they're really meant to be done continuously all the time. That's right. my, my perspective, you know. Right, right. Because yeah. I think if you've got to keep doing them, have you really got them? No. No. That's, <laughs> but that's the, that's the discipline, though. You know, I felt, I, I felt like that for the longest time, and I would never have been able to read through them. Somewhere along the line, I would just bail out. And this time, every time I have that thought, I keep mm. pushing, no, I'm going to continue. I'm going to continue. Now, and I'm at the point now where it's, I, I almost broke because some of these uh, grievance, grievances ones were giving me a difficult time, but I pushed through, I pushed through. I said, I'm not giving in, I'm not giving in. Yeah. And I'm going away and I have to figure out a way to take a book with me. I have a soft cover one that I think I'm going to take. And that one is in really bad condition, but at least I'll have something to, to continue. I thought about making copies of them. And yeah, said, you know, no, you, you can get them on your phone. Do you have an I iPhone? Can get them, I can get them online. Yes, I do. Yeah, yes. I mean, I, this is what, when I share my screen, that's Course in Miracles now. Right, right. I mean, the, I, that's the one I use because it's so easy to navigate. I can search anything. I can go to any chapter. I had not even thought about that, you know. I'm going to do that. You're absolutely right. This way, one less thing I have to carry, less weight. Right, right. And so then if you if you want the lessons to be read to you, I think it's David Hoffmeister. He, he'll actually read them. I mean, you can hit the recording button and he'll read the lesson for you. You can get them. Marianne Williamson has free. You can get her, uh, get her reading them to you too on her site. And I have right. it loaded up from ACI, whoops. Yeah, ACIM.org. Yeah. The whole thing. Okay. Is on. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for that. All, thanks for that they're, because... all, they're all freebies. Yeah. I think. Well, you're you're going to be interested to hear what it says in the next in the next chapter about about structure. Um, okay. Yeah, it says <laughs> routines. Routines as such are dangerous because they can easily become gods in their own rights. That is true. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that's such a good fun. point Freddie. but uh, we're not there yet i just wanted to mention something that really stood out for me in today in this chapter was the one where it says what can the world hold out for help out to you regardless of your judgment on its gifts that you would rather have and it made me think about you know, they say that everything in life is a gift, mm -hmm. even the gifts we don't want. Right. We think, oh, let somebody else have that gift. 
right. you know, like some real shit situation should happen to you. It's supposed to be a gift. Right. <laughs> uh, it's not always easy to see that, but it's very helpful to think of everything as a gift. Yes. And that really stuck out in that um, that sentence there, chapter three, part four. What yeah. can the world hold out to you? Because this is a this is all about comparing the world and and God, isn't it? Right. Right. Like the comparison is what can the world hold out to you, regardless of your judgments on its gift? Because there are certain gifts that I, I, I judge as not very good gifts. Right. You know, but even those are supposed to be by comparison not worth having. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. I think that's the way I see it. Yeah. And I think and too, that you know, gift is a great fertilizer, isn't it? So, so use the fertile soil that that comes from that gift and enjoy the fruits of that. Yeah. Even though it doesn't seem good at the time, or or you can choose to let that gift go to someone else who can use it more, and then you've also transformed it into something positive. Mm. Great metaphor, Mary. Excellent. <clears throat> All right. Well, now I'm excited. Now I'm excited to read the next section because Freddie gave us a little preview. So let's keep going. How should the teacher of God spend his day? To the advanced teacher of God, this question is meaningless. There is no program for the lessons change each day. Yet the teacher of God is sure of but one thing. They do not change at random. Seeing this and understanding that it is true, he rests content. He will be told all that his role should be this day and every day. And those who share that role with him will find him so they can learn the lessons for the day together. Not one is absent whom he needs. Not one is sent without a learning goal already set, and one which can be learned that very day. For the advanced teacher of God, then, <clears throat> this question is superfluous. It has been asked and answered, <clears throat> and he keeps in constant contact with the answer. He is set and sees the road on which he walks, stretched surely and smoothly before him. But what about those who have not reached his certainty? They are not yet ready for such lack of structuring on their own part. What must they do to learn to give the day to God? There are some general rules which do apply, although each one must use them as best he can in his own way. Routines as such are dangerous because they easily become gods in their own right, threatening the very goals for which they were set up. Broadly speaking, then, it can be said that it is well to start the day right. It is always possible to begin again, should the day begin with error. Yet there are obvious advantages in terms of saving time. At the beginning, it is wise to think in terms of time. This is by no means the ultimate criterion, but at the outset, it is probably the simplest to observe. The saving of time is an essential early emphasis, which although it remains important throughout the learning process, becomes less and less emphasized. At the outset, we can safely say that time devoted to starting the day right does indeed save time. Well, how much time should be so spent? This must depend on the teacher of God himself. He cannot claim that title until he has gone through the workbook, since we are learning within the framework of our course. After completion of the more structured practice periods, which the workbook contains, individual need becomes the chief consideration. 
This course is always practical. It may be that the teacher of God is not in a situation that fosters quiet thought as he awakes. If this is so, let him but remember that he chooses to spend time with God as soon as possible and let him do so. Duration is not the major concern. One can easily sit still an hour with eyes closed and accomplish nothing. One can as easily give God only an instant. And in that instant, join with him completely. Perhaps the one generalization that can be made is this. As soon as possible after waking, take your quiet time, continuing a minute or two after you begin to find it difficult. You may find that the difficulty will diminish and drop away. If not, that is the time to stop. The same procedure should be followed at night. Perhaps your quiet time should be fairly early in the evening. If it is not feasible for you to take it just before going to sleep. It is not wise to lie down for it. It is better to sit up in whatever position you prefer. Having gone through the workbook, you must have come to some conclusions in this respect. If possible, however, just before going to sleep is a desirable time to devote to God. It sets your mind into a pattern of rest and orients you away from fear. If it is expedient to spend this time earlier, at least be sure that you do not forget a brief period. Not more than a moment will do in which you close your eyes and think of God. There is one thought in particular that should be remembered throughout the day. It is a thought of pure joy, a thought of peace, a thought of limitless release, limitless because all things are freed within it. You think you made a place of safety for yourself. You think you made a power that can save you from all the fearful things you see in dreams. It is not so. Your safety lies not there. What you give up is merely the illusion of protecting illusions. And it is this you fear and only this. How foolish to be so afraid of nothing, nothing at all. Your defenses will not work, but you are not in danger. You have no need of them. Recognize this and they will disappear. And only then will you accept your real protection. How simply and how easily does time slip by for the teacher of God who has accepted his protection? All that he did before in the name of safety no longer interests him for he is safe and knows it to be so. He has a guide who will not fail. He need make no distinctions among the problems he perceives for he to whom he turns with all of them recognizes no order of difficulty in resolving them. He is as safe in the present as he was before illusions were accepted into his mind, and as he will be when he has let them go. There is no difference in his state at different times and different places, because they are all one to God. This is his safety, and he has no need for more than this. Yet there will be temptations along the way the teacher of God has yet to travel and he has need of reminding himself throughout the day of his protection. How can he do this? Particularly during the time when his mind is occupied with external things. He can but try and his success depends on his conviction that he will succeed. He must be sure success is not of him but will be given him at any time, in any place and circumstance, he calls for it. There are times his certainty will waver and the instant this occurs, he will return to early attempts, earlier attempts to place reliance on himself alone. Forget not, this is magic and magic is a sorry substitute for true assistance. It is not good enough for God's teacher because it is not good enough, is not enough for God's son. 
The avoidance of magic is the avoidance of temptation. For all temptation is nothing more than the attempt to substitute another will for God's. These attempts may indeed seem frightening, but they are merely pathetic. They can have no effects, neither good nor bad, neither rewarding nor demanding sacrifice, healing nor destructive, quieting nor fearful. When all magic is recognized as merely nothing, the teacher of God has reached the most advanced state. All intermediate lessons will but lead to this and bring this goal nearer to recognition. For magic of any kind in all its forms simply does nothing. Its powerlessness is the reason it can be so easily escaped. What has no effects can hardly terrify. There is no substitute for the will of God. In simple statement, it is to this fact that the teacher of God devotes his day. Each substitute he may accept as real can but deceive him. But he is safe from all deception if he so decides. Perhaps he needs to remember, God is with me. I cannot be deceived. Perhaps he prefers other words or only one or none at all. Yet each temptation to accept magic as true must be abandoned through his recognition. Not that it is fearful, not that it is sinful, not that it is dangerous, but merely that it is meaningless. Rooted in sacrifice and separation, two aspects of one error and no more, he merely chooses to give up all that he never had. And for this sacrifice, is heaven restored to his awareness? Is not this an exchange that you would want? The world would gladly make it if it knew it could be made. It is God's teachers who must teach it that it can. And so it is their function to make sure that they have learned it. No risk is possible throughout the day except to put your trust in magic, for it is only this that leads to pain. There is no will but God's. His teachers know that this is so and have learned that everything but this is magic. All belief in magic is maintained by just one simple-minded illusion, that it works. All through their training every day and every hour and even every minute and second, must God's teachers learn to recognize the forms of magic and perceive their meaninglessness. Fear is withdrawn from them and so they go. And thus the gate of heaven is reopened and its light can shine again on an untroubled mind. Mm. There's a whole world of difference between the world of God and the world of magic, isn't there? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. And it's just a matter of, of aligning your mind with love or God instead of aligning your mind with fear or magic. But doing it every hour, every minute, and every second, right? Like it said, it's a pra it's a constant practice. But for me, aligning the mind with God is aligning the mind with abstract abstracticity, if you like. You feel that God is abstract? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I was reading something earlier that was talking about specifics. Mm -hmm. The specifics are a bit like sort of micromanagement. Mm -hmm. their, their, their egos attempts to be in control of things, things of the world, spe specifics. Whereas God, to me, my understanding, God is really very abstract. Uh, let's say abstract love, for example, would be a, descri a description mm -hmm. that, me that 
means something to me. And yet it's hard to, it's hard to explain that to somebody right. else. Right, sure, sure. Well, they say words are but symbols of symbols, right? Hmm. Yeah. I think lesson 74 gives a good um, description about what to do during the course of the day. So it may be, maybe it's too abstract to say to, to uh, you know, to think about God all day. It suggests things like to, um, yeah, now I got to remember, right? Or should I have it open before I try to do that? Um, 16, right? Yeah, 16, we're in the trade. I have notes. So the workbook cautions us against letting drowsiness intrude upon our meditation. If you're succeeding, you will feel a deep sense of joy. Focusing on joy, then, do I, do I have a deep sense of joy? An increased alertness, do I have an increased alertness? So um, it describes this, you know, what might seem to be very abstract in a way that I, for me, I have an experience of it. For me, the Course is teaching the universal experience of love, for example. Although we don't have any commitment from the Course that says we will understand love, says in fact we won't, but we, but yes, yet there's a universal approach or, or universal mindset. And this mindset is joyful, and this mindset is peaceful, and this mindset is exhilarating. But not, not in a way like to excitement, not like that kind of exhilarating exhilarating in terms of increasing peace, increasing joy, increasing love, and, and that sort of peacefulness that goes with that where there's almost no question to be asked. And to add That's to where that, my, where my analysis. mind probably wouldn't have a question to ask because it would be still. Sorry, I interrupted somebody. No, that's uh, the way I, I um, in my mind, I, I experience, my experience is one of proximity with God in my mind. It's when I let go of desire for thinking of any kind and just rest in stillness, rest in and experience the peace of, of the quiet mind. You know, that's that's the way I do it. And I think that to do that as often as one can, for me, that is the way for me to spend the day. Even if I'm driving the car, you can still experience the oneness, the quiet of the quiet mm -hmm. mind. Yeah. While you're going about your day. Yeah. Hmm. I had a note also um, from going through this. I kept some notes for myself way back when. Time with God is experience of joining with God. Using time for meditation practices as taught in the workbook. So I believe this section instructs us toward, towards doing something, but doing something for being peaceful, doing something for being joyful. Not, not, it's not, not, not like your typical doing of something. It's, it's, it's the purpose of it is clear. I want that stillness. I want that peaceful kindness. And I think like what we're talking about is just creating that practice and that time set aside to find that peacefulness and that stillness. <clears throat> Funny you mentioned that, Freddie. I was um, driving. I remember I remember specifically driving my car down Riverside Drive in Binghamton and, and I had uh, Paco Bell's Canon D on my radio or, or, or whatever I was listening to it and I had this sensation of floating of just like that my my car was not on the road anymore it was flying and it, and it was just flying itself and it was just effortless like there was no time I wasn't there I was there but I, I mean it was completely safe I didn't have to think about driving I was driving completely fine but I was just in this space of complete joy and peace mm. in that moment of being with God. Mm. It, I, I had the same experience with my car, but, but it was floating on water because it was raining so hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I've never, I've never found that, <laughs> I've never found God to be um, abstract because uh, I've spent most of my life in that zone that Terry was talking about in the midst of chaos. 
Mm. Uh, and and that's what my the whole life has been spent trying to find that peace in the midst of utter chaos and finding a pattern and finding the the structure that needs to be done to get through that chaos in a peaceful way and having that zone of floating or not being in the space but doing everything exactly the way it's supposed to be done because right. you're giving it up to god right and, but i don't find that as being abstract i find that find that as being very concrete yeah uh, i love the consistency of god it it brings me such comfort and safety knowing that the rules more or less and they're not rules in the sense that they're rigid or binding or or domineering in any way but if you live in the laws of God, which is really that you wind up in that peace and in that pure love and security of knowing that that's truly how it is. It is that. And so for me, God has become absolute. It's become everything and therefore is no longer abstract in any way because I can count on it in every moment of my life. Very good. I love it. It's when their belief goes to certainty, you know, and there's a, you're always in the answer. So when you're asking yourself a million questions, you just say, wait, I, I have the answer. It's right here. I'm in it. Yes. I'm, getting, I'm stepping out of it when I'm in that chaos. And is the, is the answer the same for each different multiple type of question? Right. Yeah. 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 It, the answer comes to everybody in their own way, I, I would imagine. Everything is one. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's continue. We're gonna see what it's a what magic thoughts are all about. <clears throat> How do God's teachers <clears throat> deal with magic thoughts? This is a crucial question for both teacher and pupil. If this issue is mishandled. The teacher of God has hurt himself and has also attacked his pupil. This strengthens fear and makes the magic seem quite real to both of them. How to deal with magic thus becomes a major lesson for the teacher of God to master. His first responsibility is in this is not to attack it. If a magic thought arouses anger in any form, God's teacher can be sure that he is strengthening his own belief in sin and has condemned himself. He can be sure as well that he has asked for depression, pain, fear, and disaster to come to him. Let him remember then, it is not this that he would teach because it is not this that he would learn. There is, however, a temptation to respond to magic in a way that reinforces it. Nor is this always obvious. It can, in fact, be easily concealed beneath a wish to help. It is this double wish that makes the help of little value and must lead to undesired outcomes. Nor should it be forgotten that the outcome that results will always come to teacher and to pupil alike. How many times has it been emphasized that you give but to yourself? And where could this be better shown than in the kinds of help the teacher of God gives to those who need his aid? Here is his gift, most clearly given him, for he will only he will give only what he has chosen for himself. And in this gift is his judgment upon the Holy Son of God. It is easiest to let error be corrected 
where it is most apparent and errors can be recognized by their results. A lesson truly taught can lead to nothing but release for teacher and pupil who have shared in one intent. Attack can enter only if perception of separate goals has entered. And this must indeed have been the case if the result is anything but joy. The single aim of the teacher turns the divided goal of the pupil into one direction, with the call for help becoming his one appeal. This then is easily responded to with just one answer, and this answer will enter the teacher's mind unfailingly. From there, it shines into his pupil's mind, making it one with his. Perhaps it will be helpful to remember that no one can be angry at a fact. It is always an interpretation that gives rise to negative emotions, regardless of their seeming justification by what appears as facts, regardless too of the intensity of the anger that is aroused. It may be merely slight irritation, perhaps too mild to be even clearly recognized. Or it may also take the form of intense rage accompanied by thoughts of violence, fantasied or apparently acted out. It does not matter. All of these reactions are the same. They obscure the truth. And this can never be a matter of degree. Either truth is apparent or it is not. It cannot be partially recognized. Who is unaware of truth must look upon illusions. Anger in response to perceived magic thoughts is a basic cause of fear. Consider what this reaction means and its centrality in the world's thought system becomes apparent. A magic thought, by its mere presence, acknowledges a separation from God. It states in the clearest form possible that the mind, which believes it has a separate will, that can oppose the will of God, also believes it can succeed. That this can hardly be a fact is obvious, yet that it can be believed as fact is equally obvious. And herein lies the birthplace of guilt. Who usurps the place of God and takes it for himself now has a deadly enemy. He must stand alone in his protection and make himself a shield to keep him safe from fury that can never be abated and vengeance that can never be satisfied. How can this unfair battle be resolved? Its ending is inevitable for its outcome must be death. How then can one believe in one's defenses? Magic again must help. Forget the battle accept it as a fact, and then forget it. Do not remember the impossible odds against you. Do not remember the immensity of the enemy, and do not think about your frailty in comparison. Accept your separation, but do not remember how it came about. Believe that you have won it, but do not retain the slightest memory of who your great opponent really is. Projecting your forgetting onto him it seems to you, he has forgotten too. But what will now be your reaction to all your magic thoughts? They can but reawaken sleeping guilt, which you have hidden, but have not let go. Each one says clearly to your frightened mind, you have usurped the place of God. Think not he has forgotten. Here we have the fear of God most starkly represented. For in that thought has guilt already raised madness to the throne of God himself. And now there is no hope except to kill. Here is salvation now. An angry father pursues his guilty son. Kill or be killed, for here alone is choice. Beyond this, there is none. For what was done cannot be done without. The stain of blood can never be removed. And anyone who bears this stain on him must meet with death. Into this hopeless situation, God sends his teachers. 
They bring the light of hope from God himself. There is a way in which escape is possible. It can be learned and taught, but it requires patience and abundant willingness. Given that, the lesson's manifest simplicity stands out like an intense white light against a black horizon, for such it is. If anger comes from an interpretation and not a fact, it is never justified. Once this is even dimly grasped, the way is open. Now it is possible to take the next step. The interpretation can be changed at last. Magic thoughts need not lead to condemnation, for they do not really have the power to give rise to guilt. And so they can be overlooked and thus forgotten in the truest sense. Madness but seems terrible. In truth, it has no power to make anything. Like the magic which becomes its servant, it neither attacks nor protects. To see it and to recognize its thought system is to look on nothing. Can nothing give rise to anger? Hardly so. Remember then, teacher of God, that anger recognizes a reality that is not there. Yet is the anger certain witness that you do believe in it as fact. Now is escape impossible until you see you have responded to your own interpretation, which you have projected on an outside world. Let this grim sword be taken from you now. There is no death. The sword does not exist. The fear of God is causeless, but his love is cause of everything beyond all fear and thus forever real and always true. So interesting how this book is written back and forth, ego, Holy Spirit, ego, Holy Spirit. You're like bouncing from one from one interpretation to the truth. What is the definition of magic? Because it's not the, it's, I think of magic differently. I think it's the belief in separation, that there's something outside of God that can help serve or protect or save you. Okay. Concrete objects are magic. Concrete abstract, abstract love, abstract peace. Peace without opposition, in other words. Love without opposition, in other words. These are, these are abstract. Abstract is true. More and more and more so as we get corrected, more and more and more so, not to see the worship of the material world. Mm. Right. The material world is an object, one object. I see it as one object, and I see it as many objects. Which which way is better for me? So I've, I've got the glossary here of terms. So let me read magic. Magic is the attempt to solve a problem where it is not. Trying to solve a problem in the mind through physical or mindless measures, the ego strategy to keep the real problem, the belief in separation, from God's answer. Guilt is projected outside our minds onto others, attack, or our bodies, sickness, and sought to be corrected there rather than being undone in our minds by bringing it to the Holy Spirit. And it's referred to as false healing in the song of prayer. So, yeah, I think, again, it's just part of the belief in the separation. It's, a confusion, of, of it's a confusion of levels. So I, if, I, if I want to create a situation where I'm healing myself, I've already confused the levels. I've already done this, this double defiled altar thing. I've, I've, I've stepped away from true healing into the world of magic. I want, to, I want to solve my headache problem. I've stepped into the world of magic. Objects somehow bring the cause to the effect in magic, but they don't really. They really separate the cause from the effect. Right. None of this uh, is anything close to what I've ever considered to be magic. 
being a fantasy science fiction fanboy. Yeah. <laughs> and I always saw magic as the magic of life. Love, you know, the magic of magic I have see as a positive thing, not as a negative thing. And, and this like betrays it as being uh, in cohort. Magic is what the ego does. I think too, again, it's, it's words are but symbols of symbols. And a lot of it has to do with our early conditioning. I mean, a lot of times when they use the word God, I have to remind myself that it's a symbol of a symbol because I've never been as indoctrinated into religion as a lot of the text refers to. Like, you know, it's your belief in God and guilt. And it's like, well, I never really had belief in God and guilt because I never went through that indoctrination. So I think you have to kind of look at it through whatever symbols you've created to create whatever illusion or project whatever illusion you've projected onto the world. And just understand that the undoing of all of it is just aligning your mind with God or spirit. It's a reversal of the need. Why do I have a need if I'm addressing what's material and object separated? Why, why do I really have a need to do that? Why do you need to even be an I? And that's the, the you know, well, when it's you... It's a way to communicate you from me to you. No. Yeah, no, I know. But I'm just saying in, in terms of not being in control, in terms of surrendering, if you will, or joining is a word I prefer because of the negative connotations of the word surrender. But in joining with the all then you recognize that you don't have to control the healing, nor can you really do that, because healing is just another form of joining. A wound is separated, and healing it allows it to naturally come back together, which it will if we actually don't interfere with it in some way. And so that doesn't mean like don't seek any medical help or anything else, but see it all as wholeness to begin with and not as something that needs to be somehow manipulated in, in this world. It's just a different outlook on it with with a lot less fear and a lot more forgiveness slash acceptance inclusion. I love that, Mary. Yeah, I, I think that if you want to give it an interpretation, uh, it makes me think of the, the chapters that deal with the false idols. Mm, yes. I think that's what it, the ref, that's what it, to me is referencing. That's all not, that, that's... All, all, all that is not true. It's not, it, but magic to me is magic is a wondrous thing, not a, not a distractional thing or a, or a, a, a something that is false. But it I, just comes back to everybody placing their own meaning on a particular word. Yes. So it's not, there's no right or wrong. It's your particular interpretation of that five letter word. So everybody right. can say alchemy. You could say, right, there's like a, a lot of words for it. Even in, even if in the thesaurus, the synonyms for magic are illusion, right? There you so, go. So it's still <laughs> the separation. <laughs> yeah, I, I got it that um, the correlation with everything that wasn't of God in that last chapter, magic was, was referring to everything else. Other right. than God. Right. So yeah. they could have said illusion instead yeah. of magic. Hmm. They could have said illusion. And, and maybe it that almost the forces work for it. Uh, what did you say? Yeah, Carl, Carl, it almost sounds like another word for magic could be miracle for mm -hmm. for you. It yes. sounds like you're describing something that's awesomely miraculous. Right. Right. Yeah. 
in, in, in this reading, I think it's in paragraph eight, line 10, it says, magic thoughts need not lead to condemnation for they do not really have the power to give rise to guilt. Right, and I think again, they're referring to magic as an illusion. Yep, but yep. when I say I'm leaving a concert and I'll right. say that concert was magic. Or you it, could say that concert was miraculous. Yeah, or a miracle. Yeah. Right, <laughs> right. So it's just a, a choice of words. Just my 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 definition wasn't correct or going along with this. Right. It was just a different like like when yeah. I used to hear the word God, you know, I used to think God is this this being with a white beard that sits somewhere in a cloud, you know. Right. Or it's and like now there. when I think of God, I just think of I am and and the oneness. Hmm. It's like there, 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 and there, and there. <laughs> even even today, even today, the magicians are calling their show illusion. Mm -hmm. They're they're trying to I think they're trying to get away from that word. I don't know. Yeah, probably. But all right, let's continue because I think the next section is going to be really great, a great way to finish up what we've read today. How is correction made? So let me just do that so we have a few more minutes to talk before we close. <clears throat> How is correction made? Correction of a lasting nature, and only this is true correction, cannot be made until the teacher of God has ceased to confuse interpretation with fact or illusion with truth. If he argues with his pupil about a magic thought, attacks it, tries to establish its error or demonstrate its falsity, he's but witnessing to its reality. Depression is then inevitable, for he has proved both to his pupil and himself that it is their task to escape from what is real. And this can only be impossible. Reality is changeless. Magic thoughts are but illusions. Otherwise, salvation would be only the same age old impossible dream in but another form. Yet the dream of salvation has new content. It is not the form alone in which the difference lies. God's teacher's major lesson is to learn how to react to magic thoughts wholly without anger. Only in this way can they proclaim the truth about themselves. Through them, the Holy Spirit can now speak of the reality of the Son of God. Now he can remind the world of sinlessness the one unchanged, unchangeable condition of all that God created. Now he can speak the word of God to listening ears and bring Christ's vision to eyes that see. Now is he free to teach all minds the truth of what they are, so they will gladly be returned to him. And now is guilt forgiven, overlooked completely in his sight, and in God's word. Anger but screeches, guilt is real. Reality is blotted out as this insane belief is taken as replacement for God's word. The body's eyes now see, its ears alone can hear, its little space and tiny breath become the measure of reality, and truth becomes diminutive and meaningless. Correction has one answer to all of this and to the world that rests on this. You but mistake interpretation for the truth, and you are wrong. But a mistake is not a sin, nor has reality been taken from its throne by your mistakes. God reigns forever, and his laws alone prevail upon you and upon the world. His love remains the only thing there is, fear, is an illusion, for you are like him. In order to heal, it thus becomes essential for the teacher of God to let all his own mistakes be corrected. If he senses even the faintest hint of irritation in himself as he responds to anyone, let him instantly realize that he has made an interpretation that's not true. Then let him turn within 
to his eternal guide and let him judge what the response should be. So is he healed and in his healing is his pupil healed with him. The sole responsibility of God's teacher is to accept the at one for himself. at one means correction or the undoing of errors. When this has been accomplished, the teacher of God becomes a miracle worker by definition. His sins have been forgiven him and he no longer condemns himself. How can he then condemn anyone? And who is there whom his forgiveness can fail to heal? There was quite an emphasis on interpretation there. Yes, I saw that too. Mm. Yep, yep. Like the way, the way we as separate egos tend to interpret things that make a reality for ourselves. We're, right. we're kind of all wrong. Right, yeah. Well, to the other lesson, if we, if we use time correctly, then we use time to, to resolve these conflicts. That's a that's a big conflict. The interpretation issue is a big conflict, and that's right. where, that's where all these level confusions are, arise from. That as yeah. soon as I interpret something, I've made a mistake. It's 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 a miracle, distorted miracle impulse. It's not a it's not a miracle. My, every interpretation is wrong. All of them. They're all, was, they're all an attack on the truth. Yeah. When I was reading um, paragraph four, sentence seven, I was thinking of you, Carl says when his when this has been accomplished the teacher of god becomes a miracle worker by definition and i was thinking of your interpretation of magic being changed to miracle yep well right? it, in the first couple of paragraphs it, it explained everything that we were talking about right about, it, it, talk about magic being you know that yeah it explained everything yeah yeah the tr what, going back to what you said, Eric, everything other than the truth is um, is magic, illusion, not true. The trouble is, how do we? We can't really have a definition for the truth. Yeah, that's why what I said earlier was that we have to learn to live within that unifying joy. Yeah. If I don't feel unifying peacefulness or joy, or something along the lines of just really peaceful kindness, mm. then I've, I've really lost track of who really I am. Because mm. who really I am, that's my purpose. That's what God put in my heart, which I cannot really separate from it. Mm. it ties me. That's his idea of who I am. I, I cannot eliminate it. So I have to go within my heart. That's the altar that's described many times inside, inside the Course of Miracles. The altar is at the is at the holiness of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's mm. the unifying joy of the Holy Spirit. But if I see it such that I bring to my altar my upsets, frustrations, confusions, and difficulties, my uncertainties, my, any chaos or confusion, contradictions, and so on in my mind, then I'm doing the right thing because I gave up my peace to have that, and He can give me the peace to see beyond that to the truth. The truth otherwise has been altered to be something other than what it is. And that's what miracle impulses are eliminated from the truth, eliminated from the, from the world. Because the, now, I'm, now I'm working not with what is at my altar. I'm working with the untruth about myself. The untruth about myself says, I have to correct you. I have to believe in various things and so on and so forth. That's the untruth. All of it's untrue. Even yeah. when, even when we even when we we're getting better and we we're reading the Course in Miracles, we're still full of untruth. So so I, I need this meditation and this practice of kindness and so on and so forth to to gradually alter me in terms of the use of my mind. Our mind is 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 abstract. In reality, it's one mind with God, but in reality, outside of God, then it's the right mind or the wrong mind. It's a dualistic use of of um, reasoning to find rationalization more attractive so rationalization is yeah. totally unattractive really but it seems to be attractive because i'm seemingly figuring it out on my own yeah. what I was, to do and say on all that 
I always find that one of the simplest things to remember is if you're, you're ever at a time where you don't feel complete joy and complete peace, you know you've aligned with fear. And when you're at that place, you can make the conscious choice to align with God or align with love. You know, and, it, and it's just, again, every hour, every minute, every second, making that conscious choice mm. to choose again, to begin again, yeah. Yeah. and make that conscious choice to align with God, to align with love. And get out of your own way. Get out of your own way, right? <laughs> all right, guys, we're at 1.30. It's been amazing, wonderful, wonderful to have all of you here. Any other pressing questions or comments anybody wants to share before we close? When's Easter? Is it before our next meeting or? Um, I don't no, think so. The 9th. Anyway. April 9th. Yes, okay. so no. we Our next one's on the 3rd. Well, I still wish you happy Easter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Wonderful conversation as usual. Thank you. Hopefully Thank, we'll you. See you Bye. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.